God's going to say, come on, people. I know it's the last day of the conference. Hey. Said, hi. Hi. That's better. Okay, this is how we start off these sessions. Yeah, come here. Smile, everybody. Ready. One, two. Well, I'm not in it. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay, look at the height difference. This is not funny. Would you like squat? There you go. Thank you. Okay. One, two, three. There we go. Oh, what? So this is why I like presenting with Jason, because Jason always makes me look tall. Thanks, man. It's the hair. I'm sorry. Let me correct that. It's the hair gel. <laughs> Guys, welcome to PowerShell Exposed. My name's Jason. This is Jeff. We're going to be uh, showing you guys some of the oddball stuff that we deal with here in the PowerShell world. So, without further ado, Yap, do you want to take things over? Tell a little bit about yourself? Uh, of course. Well, I'm Yap. I love PowerShell. Uh, very happy to be here. Thanks for being here in the early morning. I know I wouldn't have been here uh, if, I had a, if I had the chance to sleep in. So, uh, we're going to show you a couple of fun things with, uh, with PowerShell. Um, let's get into it. Am I starting? Are you starting? You're starting. That's why I'm standing over here. I'm out of the line of fire right now. Because <laughs> hey, I'm freaking awesome. No. <laughs> he he did, didn't just need a bigger font. He also needed his title to be updated. So... Oh, you are me. <laughs> Just for the record, I did not make the slides. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to go over some uh, fun and quirky stuff in PowerShell. So the first thing, I love PowerShell help. And uh, one of the problems I always have when I'm working in PowerShell help is it's always a lot of text. So when I'm... Uh, when I want help, you do that's help full. It starts scrolling, and most of the time, I actually don't need all the information. Sorry? You, the what? sand is not flowing. Oh. So we got an extra 10 minutes. <laughs> so what I've, uh, what I've done here, I made a very short function that I always load in my profile, get brief help. So. Basically, when you're using get, get help, as everything in PowerShell, we return PowerShell objects. So if we do get member, you can see that there's a lot of uh, properties available. If you do get help, get help, we can see all the parameters that help has. Still a lot of text, not what we are looking for. Uh, we can list all the parameter names that are available for get help. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Oh, by the way, in the back, can, can you read it? Does it need to be bigger? Bigger? Cool. Big enough? Good. All right. Um, we can also get the descriptions of the parameters. So I'll get the first, uh, the first parameter, which is category. And if you look at the text, we can see all the text that's available there. So let's put this into practice. I'll use it on get child item. And we get a nice little list of what every parameter is doing. So it's just a quick, easy thing to uh, get a quick overview of which parameters are available. No talking in the front, please. Jared, come on, behave. And uh, we can also use some other commandlets, and we get a nice uh, instant overview of what is uh, available uh, for every commandlet. Uh, another one I really like, when I'm typing stuff, I often forget what I'm doing. And what I used to do, I always press up, up, up to go back to what I've done so far. Uh, if we get the history, does everyone know the command to get the PowerShell history? I'm going to ask Ben. No? It, it, it's history. Well, actually, it's get history, but it auto-completes to history because you never have to enter get. Uh, if you just type the noun, then uh, you get uh, PowerShell as a last-ditch effort to find a commandlet that works. We'll put get in front of it. 
Thanks for that, Jeffrey. So now if we want to uh, execute one of the commands that we already executed, uh, for example, let's, do, uh, let's get the description for a category. I see 21 here. So we just do sign 21 and I'll press tab. And there we go. We have the same command again. Uh, ben already mentioned there's also control R. Unfortunately, it's not available in the ISE. I don't think so. Control R, nope. But we can check out what Jason has been doing on his computer because I'm presenting on Jason's computer. So let's take a look. Control R. So we can Are you sure that. you want to know? Uh, I'll, I'll touch on incognito mode you, in PowerShell. You, 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 don't you dare. <laughs> you know, I use that for government work, right? So before you start, be real careful what you bring up. So here we go. This is, uh, this is a quick way to get uh, to search back in your history. So this, uh, this functionality that's in PS Readline, you can press Ctrl R and you can search back. For those of you who work on Unix and Linux systems, uh, this will be familiar to you. So. And if we press enter, we execute it. Obviously, there's no Internet Explorer. Because Another thing I like to do is uh, invoke item. And I end up using the shorthand uh, most often. Uh, invoke item uh, dot. And we get a shell. Uh, we get an Explorer window of the current wor working folder. So it's quite useful when I'm uh, working uh, working on some scripts, or I'm in a path where I quickly need to go. It's a very short command. Can I run this on your system? Can I run the disk line on your system? What's it going to bring up? Because like I said, I've got government stuff on there. OK, I just heard I'm not going to run this command. <laughs> but I'm Why don't you put on, I don't know, can you run that on the VM or not? I can run it on the VM. Where, where's the VM? It's on the, the next virtual. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, it is. I think you should repeat the question, otherwise it's not oh, in the recording. They wanted to know if Cindy's House of Sin is a government site. <laughs> uh, we have lawmakers. Let's see. Okay, excellent. So, here we go. If we just type get PS read line option, font size. Here we go. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Uh, it's probably still going to be small in the back. I will make it. Let's go for 36. Perfect. So we can see the path here. Uh, every user uh, that uh, has its own PS read line history, it's a plain text file that contains all the PowerShell commands that have been run while PS read line was active. So if we prefix this with ii, it will open it in Notepad or whatever your standard. Uh. Uh, so you'll get a complete overview of everything you've typed ever since you started using uh, this system. This is obviously a very new system, or Jason actually uses the GUI instead of PowerShell, as he always pretends. How dare you? <laughs> this is PowerShell exposed. Okay, uh, let's keep on going. Desktop one. So the nice, uh, the nice thing about uh, PS Readline, there's a lot of options, and we can see here. Load it here. Let's go back to the desktop. Uh, desktop two. Thank you. PM. There we go. <laughs> and we can see that uh, the maximum history count, and this is the default setting, is the last 4,000 commands we've executed in PowerShell. And I checked on my own laptop before uh, coming into this session. My laptop has been up and running for a year, and I'm not yet at 
uh, 4,000 commands. So it's quite a big history. Problem with this is, if you're typing your passwords, PS Readline is logging this, uh, is, is always logging this if it's active. So it's only active if you're running uh, the PowerShell console. It's not available in ISE. So I'll show you how we can disable this. And this is a command that I always find, uh, always find quite scary. Because it's called remove module PS read line. And unlike what you would expect, it doesn't actually remove a PS read line from your system, but it just removes it from your current session. So let's run this in the VM, desktop two. So if we take a look at the history now, we can see everything we're typing, including the command I just typed, is available there. Now if we do remove module, you'll see we lose all the fancy colors. And it's no longer logging it to disk. So this is kind of incognito mode for all the funky stuff that JSON does, all the government stuff. You should probably either delete the file or... You should tell me what you do with my computer ahead of time. <laughs> So, moving on, uh, another new feature that was uh, introduced in PowerShell, I think it was 5.1, is that PowerShell started reporting uh, how long it takes for your profiles to load. And it's all very nice, but you don't always want to see the message. And I've seen the question quite often, how can you get rid of uh, the notification your profile took this long to load? So normally when we start PowerShell, I'll make this one a little bit bigger. There we go. 36 is a good size. So if we start PowerShell, yeah, which version of PowerShell are you running? Which version of PowerShell is this? <coughs> version table. Yes? Okay, so oh, we can fix that. Notepad. Profile. Start, sleep, one. So help me if you break my machine, man. <laughs> it was your idea to let me use your computer. I told you to use the <laughs> VM. <laughs> <laughs> so now if I start PowerShell, here we go. We should get the notification, but we don't. Okay, let's go for the VM. <laughs> Desktop number two. We'll do the same thing in the profile. I'll make it a little bit slower. Start, sleep, one. Mm, okay, I'm going to leave this uh, for what it is. Notepad, uh, unfortunately, does not work well with administrative shares, uh, administrative locations, so I wasn't able to save it. Uh, okay, next one. Uh, the core of it was if you do no logo, uh, it no longer shows uh, either PowerShell, uh, uh, the year is 2016, and the profiles. So it's a bit neater if, you, uh, if that's what you're looking for. So PowerShell on 64-bit systems also has uh, the 32-bit binaries available. Uh, by default, if you just type PowerShell, it will go for the 64-bit. If, uh, if you want to go for the 32-bit, it's stored in sys, uh, syswall. So let's see what we get. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to check if this is a 64-bit process. If I do PowerShell stored in system32, it's true. If I do it in syswo, it will be false. So there are some uh, snap-ins. We are getting rid of snap-ins more and more. Even VMware recently switched over to PowerShell modules. But there are some, uh, yeah, can I get an applause? <laughs> I didn't make the VMware module, by the way, but I'll happily take credit for it. Thanks, guys. So some modules are a bit, uh, some snap-ins are a bit finicky. They need a 32-bit process or they need single threading. Uh, if you need single threading, you can start PowerShell with STA or with MTA if you specifically need multi-threading. So if you ever run into that issue, that is uh, something you can use. 
All right, moving on. Um, I, uh, I abstracted the internet connection away from my demo because I'm a little bit scared of using demos. So I'll be showing the command, but I'll actually be reading the data from disk, so we won't have to rely on the internet in the next demo. So what I've done, I've, uh, I've used a module called Project Oxford. It's a module created by uh, Pratik. He's a PowerShell enthusiastic from India. He makes a lot of cool stuff. And what this module does is it allows you to interface with the, with the Bing APIs. And I'm going to show a couple of examples of what you can, uh, what you can do with this. So I have a couple of pictures from uh, PSConf EU. And we're going to take a look at what the Bing API thinks of this. <laughs> so we have the polar bear. Did you all enjoy the polar bear at uh, the zoo this time? It was amazing. Obviously, we have Jeffrey, the 10-year uh, anniversary cake. And we have Rob, SQL DBA with a beard. And we're going to see what the Bing API says about these pictures and if it's accurate. So the command we would use for that, uh, we use get image analysis, and then we can just uh, give the URL of the picture. So this is the polar bear. And I've stored the results locally, so we can see here. What does it think of this picture? It will tell us it's outdoor, there's a tree, a rock, an animal. Polar bear standing next to a rock wall. So it's quite, quite accurate. Are you ready for this one, Jeffy? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. A indoor group of people standing in front of a TV. Well, they were sitting down and there was a projector, but it's pretty accurate. And the last one. <laughs> And here we get a man with a hat talking on the cell phone. Well, let's go back to this picture. I can't quite spot the cell phone, but maybe the beard looks too much like a cell phone. <laughs> I don't. So, moving on. We can also uh, get the news. Uh, if you type get news, you get the 30 or 40 most recent articles. I selected the top five. So, let's do this. And you can see, well, obviously I did it in Germany, so we get all the German news. Uh, I don't really know what it means. My German is uh, too bad, but I think something happened uh, with Obama. Is he still the president, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Another interesting one. Uh, is uh, get sentiment. So this will uh, give a rating about how positive or negative uh, a certain text uh, a certain text is. So uh, it's great to be here at PSConf EU. Well, let's see what we get back from this. Uh, it will give us back the string. It will give back how positive it thinks it is and how negative, which is just whatever is remaining, and the overall sentiment which is positive. So that's uh, all good. Next one, it is raining. I do not like the cold, wet weather in Holland. Well, I, I thought I was being quite positive about the Dutch weather, but apparently Bing does not agree with me here. Uh, the news, let's see how positive the news is and if it can actually read German. That's not the one I was looking for. Oh, okay, moving on. Uh, did you guys see the one-liner that Tobias posted? So you can uh, get a grid view of what is uh, of the whole schedule. Okay, I decided to use uh, get sentiment on the on the descriptions of all the talks that we have, and I selected uh, the most positive one and the two most negative ones, and. Let's see if the people are actually in the room here. No, I, I warned them ahead of time, so. <laughs> so, let's see, where is that one? Hmm. Ah, here we go. So, I got the bottom two and the top one, and I'll import this one. 
So what we can see here is Will Soder, he was the number one speaker last year at PSConf EU, but the Bing API thinks it's a not just a little bit negative, but it's only 0.02% positive. So <laughs> I think he needs a little bit of positivity into his uh, talks. Matt Graeber, I'm starting to see a common theme here, only 4% positivity. I think the security guys really need to lighten up a bit. But well, Jared is, uh, is still smiling, so. And Rob, uh, SQL DBA with a beard, we just saw his picture. Well, he's just one big piece of happiness, so. <laughs> <laughs> so what you need if you want to get started with this, you can go to Bing, do I have the link here? Yes. Uh, you can go to Bing Developers API. Uh, you can register for free, uh, for free API tokens. You get like 5,000 a month and you can do like 10 hits every 30 seconds. So it's quite nice to play around with. You can do translation, you can test for adult content, you can see what's in pictures, you can see what the age of people is, but I decided to leave that one out of the, uh, out of the demos because I don't want to get into a fight. Uh, you look like 40. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> that was uh, my part, Jason, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, we are not going to leave this picture up on my screen. I set it as a desktop background. Oh, I set it as a desktop background, uh -huh. and it will set itself again every uh -huh. uh, 15th yeah, of the month. You're playing a dangerous game with me now, buddy. You live on the other side of the ocean. I think I'm safe. Yeah. <laughs> Never underestimate my power. All right, guys. <laughs> All right, guys, so what I really do for a living, I'm a Microsoft trainer, and I specialize in giving both Windows Server and, of course, PowerShell. What that means is every week I have from 5 to 20 people crying on my shoulder, and I get to help them figure out a few things. And also comes up with some very weird requests from time to time. So one day in class, we're coming back from lunch. Am I see the movie War Games? about a nice game of chess. Oops. So I had this one fire up. Of course, if I press F5 and not enter. How about a nice game of chess? Okay, just something silly, right? And all of a sudden the hands start going up. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So Jason, can you get this to greet people when they turn on their computer? Okay, well, let's see. I don't know why, but hey, let's play with that just a little bit here. So I'm going to go ahead and remember, guys, never put a password in a script. It's bad. That's why I do it. All right. So let's just go ahead. <laughs> let's just go ahead and put this in here. And uh, next thing I need to do is we're going to create a little login script. Now, this is the actual code. And by the way, guys, um, I'll put a link up to download this code at the end of the presentation. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and create a quick little script, and we're just going to put it somewhere out on the domain controller where every one of our machines can find it. All right, and then we're going to go ahead and create a little quick group policy. Yes, I'm going to do this manually because I have to do this in a Windows class, which means people don't use as much PowerShell as I like, which is okay because then I see them next week in my PowerShell class. So we're going to have one called greeting, and I'm just going to quickly link it up to the domain. And let's make a few quick changes here. Like, for example, I want to make sure that every time this person logs in or our users log in, they're going to have a little login script playing. All right, so let's see if we can find it here. I said I tucked it away in sysval so everybody will be up, and it didn't go there. Well, don't you love it when something doesn't work? Did it error on me? Oh, let's try that again. Hey, there it is. Okay. Probably helps if I would pay attention. All right. Now, the next thing we need to make sure we set up so this thing works is a little group policy preference here. We're going to make a little change to the registry. 
And of course, since this is something that's manual, I can't memorize how to do that. So I'm going to use my little cheat sheet here real quick. And let's go ahead and create a new preference in the registry. This little preference is simply going to say, let's not wait five minutes for this to kick off because we want to freak our users out as soon as they log into this machine. So let's see, local key, software, Microsoft, uh, Windows, Windows, there it is, current version, policies. Yeah, we're going in deep on this one. Policies, system, there we go. And we're going to add a key called, and hopefully I can spell this right, enable first logon animation. It's going to be a D word. We're going to set it to zero. And that should hopefully kill it off. Oh, wait, one more thing I need to do on the computer side. I need to make sure that we don't wait. Or that, uh, sorry, that one turns off the logon animation. This is the one that actually turns off the uh, five minute wait. So let's go in here, was it system, group policy, and we should be just about ready to go. Configure the logon script delay to zero. All right, let's go ahead and give this one a quick try and see. Oh good, my virtual machine went down. That's okay, we need to refresh the group policy. Nice thing about VMs on solid state, they come back to life very quickly. So we're gonna go ahead and log in and see if this actually works. Now I asked the person, why did you want to do this? Guess what the response was? Well, I'm sorry, what was that? There you go. That's actually what they said. It's fun. Let's see if it went through or not. No guarantees. As we all know with group policy, everything is a patience-driven activity. Morning, Jason. There we go. So imagine all your users coming in one morning and all of a sudden, maybe just a random strings of text starts, or starts talking to them. Imagine the text call, calls that morning. I didn't press the issue any further. I really didn't want to know what they were doing. All right. So how about this one? So I'm over here on the domain controller right now. And I'm going to go into the ADSI editor and look at some properties of Active Directory. And we got one here called MSDS Machine Account Quota. It's set to a value of 10 by default. What does this do? Yeah. I'm sorry, what was that? How many machines your standard with no special privilege users can join to the domain? Anybody know about that one before right now? All right, anybody about to freak out? Yeah, I would. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new user. We're going to call this user Dan Problem. You see, Dan has been a complete pain in your side for a very long time. So what Dan's going to do here is, oh, let's bring this back to life. This is Dan's personal machine. If it's a personal machine, isn't Dan a local administrator on this machine? I would say that Dan could probably install some software on this machine because obviously it's not joined to the domain. App Locker's not on there. Nothing's preventing Dan from actually doing any, uh, putting anything on there. So what if this machine would all of a sudden mysteriously pop up as an authenticated member of your domain? Well, here, let's just go ahead and do that real quick. So we're going to go ahead and add it in to our domain. It's already named Client2, so I'm going to add it in. Now remember, Dan does not have anything other than standard user. I just created Dan, so adatum.com. All right, so adatum, Dan P, I believe is the username. We're going to give Dan's password. Uh-oh, uh I didn't completely undo my practice run. Here, let me delete the account out. Where is my, am I on the domain controller? There it is. Let's go to ADUC and see if I actually forgot to do that part. You guys will see at the end of my code is the undo command for everything I do. Yeah, I messed that one up. Delete. We get, oops, we get to do do-overs, right? Okay. Try it again. ADATOM backslash Dan P. 
I'll tell you what's been a long time since I've had to join a computer manually. Oh boy, Dan just joined that computer full of all those neat little pesky viruses and worms and trojans and crypto locker on your network. Okay, so here's the big question for you guys. How do you know who's already done this to you? Yeah, that's the usual answer I get, right? Okay, well, let's go back over here and look at some PowerShell code. There's actually a, pr a property of the computer object called MSDS Creator SID. This property does not get enumerated unless, or does not get filled unless somebody did what we just did. Now, if I delegate out to you the rights to do it, to join the machine to the domain, it's not going to do it. If we do it through some automated system like WDS or what have you, it's not going to do it. So let's go ahead and figure out who did this. So I'm going to grab a list of all the computers in my domain, all six of them. And uh, of course, I'm asking for a couple of extra properties. Is there an MSDS creator SID and when was it created? I'm also going to grab a list of all of my users. And we're just going to quickly cycle through there and see if we can detect anybody who's doing something bad. Oh, looky there. Now, how many of you have more than two clients on your domain? So, actually, if you go into ADUC, you can see this stuff. I'm going to go ahead and turn on. We have the advanced features already turned on. Let me do a little refresh here. I'm just going to randomly go through my computers. Under the attribute editor... I'm going to filter to show only attributes that have values. And if I scroll through here, I can see the MSDS creator SID, which happens to be the SID of the user. So let's say your environment, I don't know, I work in an environment of 315,000 clients. So this should only take about five minutes, right? Anybody work with a few more clients than that? So imagine how long that would take. Well, that's the SID. Now you've got to figure out whose SID it is. So using PowerShell, you can see within a matter of a few seconds, we can see if anybody has done this to you. And uh, I'll be honest with you, whenever I show this in the server class, you can hear the pens starting to scratch on the paper because people don't realize that that can happen to them. All right. Next up, let's talk a little bit about some programming. So, some of you sat, I can recognize a few in the room sat through um, one of my sessions earlier on how to make your code run faster. We actually have, yes, sir. I'm sorry, what was that? Okay. And you can also set the MS uh, DS machine account quota to zero. And I'll be honest, that's the first thing I do whenever I inherit a new system. So two ways of doing it. Thank you very much. All right, so let's talk about where object. Now, whenever we work, when I'm teaching these PowerShell classes, I try to get people to look at the commandlet that puts something in the pipeline. Does it have some parameters? that does self-filtering so that you don't have to do anything else. It generally turns out faster if we eliminate what we don't need as early as possible in the PowerShell pipeline, but we have special cases and those commandlets can't always self-filter. That's where we have where object comes into play. So with where object, we have a couple different syntaxes. We have the basic syntax we got with PowerShell 3. We have the advanced syntax that we've had since PowerShell 2. And then we also now have this thing called the method, the where method. It is structured a little bit differently, but it does have some special features. And again, all those three did the exact same thing. So let's see here. We are actually able to struct, I'm sorry? Better? Okay. So we have a couple different ways that we can actually write this thing. But we also have some options that we can put in there, like this first one only returns, what, the first four it received? We have lots of different options because, you know, we have things, if I only wanted me the first five objects in the pipeline, we pipe at the select object, first parameter five. But we can actually do that with where objects. So here shows me the first one or the first two. I can do the last one, the last three. All right. So again, we have a couple of options. This one here, we can have a skip until. So in other words, I'm going to skip every object that I receive until I hit something that matches my trigger, matches my filter. And let's go to the top here and see the CPU value. I was waiting to the current object CPU is greater than 50. Right there it is. And then it started showing me everything in the pipeline. We also can get highs and lows. Like for example, I'm going to look at the CPU value. If it's greater than 200, split. 
Let's see what this does for us. You can see I'm assigning it actually to two variables. The high, CPU value high, and whoops, there's everything else that's underneath it. So in my situation, I only had one object where its CPU value was greater than 200, and here's the rest. So we didn't have to run it twice to figure it out. We could run it only once. And we can also do one until. Right, let's say this one. Run until, uh, look for all ob CPU objects greater than 2000 until. The until property returns elements until a condition is true, then skip the rest. So I don't think my processor's pegged right now. We'll take it down to 20 and try again. There we go. So we received everything until we meet that criteria, then we stop. So lots of different ways that we can play around with the until, excuse me, where object method. So questions that come up is which one's faster. So I'm going to fire off some code here that is going to run the basic, advance, and the method syntax. And these are actually reporting what's called ticks. I'm going to run a few times because I am in a virtual machine. You just don't know what's running in the background. Ticks, by the way, is, what is it, one ten thousandth of a nanosecond, so I think it's a pretty small measurement of time. But let's see here. Looks like the basic syntax is going to win today. Up oh, there it is. The methods are winning. Generally, when I run through these, through several iterations, the method is actually faster. So if speed's a concern, you might want to read up on that. All right. How many of you have had a virus before? <laughs> okay, let me just put it this way. I cannot stop CryptoLocker. If I could stop CryptoLocker, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be on my own private Caribbean island, okay? So I can't stop CryptoLocker, but this is actually a real world situation I got hit with. So I was uh, sitting in the uh, San Jose airport with a two, uh, excuse me, a four hour layover. So I was kind of kicking back in the lounge there and I got a call from a buddy of mine in Chicago. And he said, Jason, I've got a problem. I said, no kidding, that's the only time you ever call me. And he says, no, seriously, I've got a virus. I said, go see a doctor. Now he's really getting upset with me. So he told me what's happening. Um, they had a virus on the system. I said, so what does your central antivirus system tell you? He goes, that's the problem. We can't touch it right now. Ooh, cool. All right. But he was able to give me the name of the virus. Fortunately, this was not one of these newer polymorphic, metamorphic chaos viruses that we have out there. It actually had a signature. So I actually um, turned this into a lesson on using the PowerShell providers. The PowerShell providers are pretty cool. They give us really easy access to things that, uh, who's done VBScript, by the way? Anybody? How many of you have had to program something to touch the registry in VBScript? All right, it's kind of like draw a target on the wall and ram your head through it, right? All right, it gets really easy in PowerShell. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check one of my remote machines to make sure we have a registry setting. Okay, I'm going to give it one of the actual signatures that was placed in the registry of this virus. You can look that up on the Internet. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, put it on there. We're going to use test path. Now, that's a really easy way for me to say, yeah, that exists there. This machine needs a little loving care. The problem is, just like all of you, Jeff had a few more client machines than just two or three. So we needed a way to do this a little faster. So what I'm going to do here is run my search virus signature code. Now, there's a whole help file associated with it. We're not going to go through all of it. Um, but what I'm going to do is tell it just to go ahead and search every computer in my environment. Now, a few of these machines are not turned on. I apologize. I should have done that. But I'm going to scroll up to server one, and it has a registry value match of true. That means this particular one had the vi has the virus. Let's take a look at the first one, the domain controller. False. It does not have the virus. So we did not have the ability to use the antivirus system. But um, what Jeff was able to do is quickly identify the machines in his environment that had the virus, and they're able to get out there and cl clean them off before they replicated further. So the neat thing about it, because uh, especially in our PowerShell classes, we try to make sure we follow the practice of object in, object out. We are able to pipe that to where object reg value match is true. And he was getting a definitive list. When he was done, they ran back, they redid it, and found no more contaminations. They were able to do it fast enough before the virus spread. All right, so that was pretty cool for them. They didn't think it was cool, and they got the bill, of course. 
Uh, but <laughs> yeah, it worked out really well for them. So again, I cannot stop crypt. I can find it on its known signatures, but I cannot stop what's out there. But for these other viruses, you can see this is a good example of how to use those PowerShell providers and directly access the registry. How many of you have ever had to maybe make a setting, a manual setting in registries across your entire environment? Ready? Huh. This code may be easily modified. I'm just saying. All right. Okay, so. How many of you have users who, for whatever reason, ignore that little pop-up? Your password's going to expire in 14 days. Just the laughter should tell you how bad this problem is. I never could understand. Okay, I do because they're lazy. I mean, because they just zone it out, right? So I actually had somebody ask me, Jason, we need to be able to be a little more proactive. And I said, so the pop-up window doesn't work? And they just kind of looked at me like this. Really? So they needed a way to figure out whose passwords were going to expire sometime very soon. So I asked them, are you using what's called a fine-grained password policy? What's a fine-grained password policy or password settings object? Did you know that you can have more than one password policy on your systems? No, we had that one. We call it the catch-all, okay? So uh, if so you do not define one of these or assign someone, it's how we normally define a password. They fall in that category. But when you're working with fine-grained password policies, there's a few caveats. Like, for example... Are they assigned to more than one password policy? Which one's effective? If you're assigned by a group and then individually by your user account, one of those two is going to win. It's going to be your user account. So guys, we're going to go ahead and set up a few. This is the, this just sets up one of them. If you look real carefully at the command line, new AD fine grained password policy, it pretty much defines what we would expect in a standard password policy. So I'm going to quickly create three of these different policies. Because we had to address the question, was anybody's passwords affected by this or were they on the, the standard catch-all version? I'm going to go ahead and create three security groups. I'm then going to create, don't you love PowerShell? I don't have to do any work. I'm going to go ahead and create 500 user accounts. Yes, I'm enabling them. And then I'm also going to assign them into uh, accounts or into security groups. Now, that's going to be user 001, user 100, whatever. If there's a one somewhere in their name, they're going to be assigned to group one, two, group two, three, or group three, which means some will be assigned to all groups, some will not be assigned to any groups. And it probably helps if I selected the entire block of code. All right. Then I need to assign those groups to certain policies, fine-grained password policies. So we'll go ahead and do that. Oh, so it looks like we're still making our user accounts. Maybe I should have turned up my processor speed before we started. This is that awkward silence you get in the middle of a presentation. There we go. Okay, moving on. Now, I'm also going to assign users by their user count explicitly to a couple of these groups, depending on, again, those final three numbers. So we will have some users in all three groups and explicitly signed, and we'll still have users who are assigned to nothing. All right, so let's go ahead and see what happens. This took just a tad bit of research. First of all, I had to figure out how to get the maximum password age that you're allowing. Even though we set it through GPO, it's kind of stored in a weird place. And you can see it took just a little bit of math to figure that part out. Let me uh, put my cursor there. All right, next of all, I had to write some supporting functions like make sure certain modules there. This is going to rely on the Active Directory module just so that you're aware. All right, if there's a difference between passwords, what's the difference? And then, of course... The actual code that gathers all that information. I'm going to scroll to the very end of this so I can run it all in one big batch. Because I can see here the Wicked Witch is about to kill Dorothy. We're almost out of sand time here. 15? Okay, that's cool. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and run it. Now, let's see how many users' passwords are about to expire in the next 10 days. That means for, what, the last four or five days they were receiving the bloop pop-up window and completely ignoring it. Let's see what we got here. A full screen on this one. And here are the users who are ignoring that little pop-up window. 
So what they're able to do is take this and pipe this into another custom PowerShell command to kind of email them. Apparently, they paid more attention to their email than they do to the bloop pop-up window. Let's see. Display the first 100 user objects that include both those that will have passwords expired to 10 days and those that do not. Now we can see the entire list, and you can see how many days they have. Of course, 42 is the default value for um, password policies in Windows. And you can see a lot, these users did not fall under any one of those policies. That's why they're at 42. The ones where I did create policies on, their password expired in 10, 15, or 20 days from now when I created them. These, of course, are some special accounts or have never been logged in since they're negative numbers. But anyhow, now you have a way to produce objects that tell you when your users are getting ready or should be getting ready to change their passwords. So what, it's password 001, and tomorrow they'll do password 002. Is that how it runs? Yeah. All right. All right, how many of you would like to retire? Well, you feel a little stressed there, Jeff? All right. <laughs> All right, so here's a neat little one here. Um, so I have a lot of trouble explaining the difference between uh, maybe an export command and a convert to command. You know, the export commands will take your object and convert it to some type of a data format and commit it to disk. The convert commands does the same conversion and just throws the entire string in the pipeline. Well, there's also a way of taking those strings and putting them back into objects. So I'm going to play around here a little bit with Yahoo Finance. So I have a little uh, command here called get stock quote. And what you can see here is where we're pulling some information from Yahoo. Now, they actually publish their information so I know how to create these little strings so it tell, I can tell it what information I'm interested in. I'm going to go ahead and uh, put this function in the memory. Let's see how our stock prices are doing today. I did not, oh, I'm not on the internet on this one. My bad. Let me switch over to the other side. This is the nice thing about regions. I can take them and move them fast. Nothing you did is going to mess up my machine, is it? No, absolutely not. But I do agree, regions are pretty awesome. I'm sorry? <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> All right, there it is. You can get stock data. Now, this is not live. Don't bet your entire career on it. It's like 15 minutes late. But anyhow, what I wanted to show is that stuff comes back in the form of a CSV file, which is something that we can easily convert back into a PowerShell object. So here we're using the invoke rest method. We're going out to Yahoo, and it's actually giving us software that we can use to pull information. And there is a lot of information that's published out there on the internet that we can consume and use inside of our organizations. Of course, you know you have to trust whatever you're getting. And if it's a free service, don't count on it being online every day. This one's been working out pretty well for me. So that's how you can actually pull some information from the internet. One little caveat on this though is that it did not come with what's in that first row of data in the CSV. I'm sorry, what was that? The header information. So I actually had to kind of inject that header information in. So when PowerShell read it in, it did it correctly. Let me just uh, comment out these two lines. Data doesn't quite look right at this point, does it? No. So, yeah, you have to still play around with the code a little bit, but you can pull information off from the Internet. All right. Guys, what questions do you have for us? Silence. Nothing? Oh, I know we're awesome yet, but, man, we nailed it. I mean, if you have a question, I will walk up to you, hand you the microphone, can be part of the presentation. Oh, come on. In a room full of IT folks, no one wants to speak. I think they need their coffee, Jason. I think they need their coffee. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, guys. 
Oh, I didn't put a link up there. Oh, that is my bad. I haven't made a link for this yet. Well, I'll tell you what, guys. In a few minutes, I'll have a link. I'll be outside there. If you guys would like to take a quick little snapshot of the link to download that code, just see me out. There's a little desk out there. I'll be out there and be happy to give it to you. That presentation that, I don't know, I gave like 1,200 lines. How much was in yours? I think about two, three hundred. Yeah, so there's a lot of code there. I know you guys weren't writing it down. Guys, thank you very much for coming today. We appreciate it. One last thing. Remember, in October, for those of you who like this conference, we are also doing another one in Singapore, which, let me tell you, you will not starve in Singapore. I gained weight last time I was there. So please feel free to join us while we're out there, all right? Take care, everybody.